Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first ICCJ webinar of the year. My name is Elisa Cagliari. I'm a researcher at Fondazione Anni Enrico Mattei, an international center for climate governance, and I will be moderating the new ICCG webinar series focusing on disaster risk reduction, uh, which is the ICCG hot topic for 2017. And it's really a great pleasure for me uh, to kick off this new series with uh, a talk by Svenja Surminski, Senior Research Fellow at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, which is part of the London School of Economics and Political Science, who will present today a new business case for disaster risk management based on the multiple benefits, well, the multiple dividends, as uh, she calls them, uh, of resilience. And as you know, uh, the 2030 development agenda, which includes the Paris Agreement, the CNA framework for disaster risk reduction, and also the sustainable development goals, has placed a special emphasis on the need to um, foster and to build disaster and climate resilience. Uh, however, uh, the reality is that we're not investing enough in resilience, uh, especially when considering ex ante disaster risk management measures, and despite the rising cost of disasters. And one reason for that is that policymakers usually see this kind of intervention as paying off only when a disaster strikes. But as uh, Svenja will tell us, there are actually a number of uh, benefits that materialize uh, and are gained independently of whether or not a disaster event actually occurs. And that can actually foster, uh, sustain, and catalyze uh, development. So, without spoiling much, uh, the webinar will um, outline the concept and illustrate it, these different uh, uh, dividends. And just let me mention that uh, it is based on an um, exciting new book edited by Svenja, which is uh, Realizing the Triple Dividend of Resilience, uh, a book funded uh, by the World Bank and the Global Facility for uh, Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery. Uh, very briefly about our speaker, although I know she is a, a well-known scientist and distinguished scientist. Well, Svenja is program leader for the Climate Risk Insurance and Private Sector Workstream at the Grantham Research Institute. Uh, her research focuses on climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction with a special interest in the role of the private sector. She has published widely. She's also contributing author to the IPCC, and she's been collaborating with the industry and policymakers for many, many years. Um, so now I leave the floor to Svenja. Uh, Svenja, you have 30 minutes. Uh, after that, we will have a question and answer uh, session of 20 minutes where, where um, our audience will be the protagonist, so I invite all the attendees to send their questions through the chat. Uh, you can see on the control panel on the right hand side of uh, the screen. So thank you again for accepting to be with us today and I leave the floor to you Svenja. Okay, well thank many thanks Elisa and it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of work with, with you and your colleagues, so it's, it's really exciting to see that you've dedicated this whole year to this topic of disaster risk reduction. Um, and yeah, I think that the talk today really want, in the talk today I really want to do two things. So I want to illustrate this new concept, the triple resilience dividend. And I also want to discuss, you know, how maybe the more practical end of resilience looks like by looking at one sector that is often brought in, in close connection with resilience, and that's the insurance industry. And it's maybe no surprise that I like to talk about insurance industry because I spent um, 10 years of my professional career working in the insurance industry. So I'm really keen to explore how actually this whole idea around resilience and disaster risk reduction can be applied in the context of um, insurance as an instrument. So um, let me see how this works. Um, I will now stop showing you my um, start showing you my screen. Um, yeah. Um, and just as a starting point. I think it's important for us to, to reflect that, you know, this is not, not just a, an issue for developing countries. Um, 
you know, just maybe just as a start, I would encourage everyone to just kind of reflect, you know, where you sit today. You know, do you feel resilient? Whatever that might mean to you personally, I think that's important. Just just think about, do you feel resilient? Resilient in the context of various hazards, various risks. Do you think the building that you're sitting in is resilient? Do you think that the city that you that you live in or that you work in is resilient? Do you think that the companies or the, the, the organizations that you engage with are resilient? And do you think you live in a resilient country where the government is supporting resilience? I think when you kind of look at it this way, it just shows you all the different dimensions. And I know it's a hugely complicated topic, resilient, and we could spend days discussing what it actually means and what perspective to use and who, you know, from, from which angle and in which context. And you're relieved to hear that that's not my purpose today. So I will give you a very quick definition, but this is more for pragmatic reasons, so to keep us all you know, on the same page, if you like. But I acknowledge it's a huge, and I, to some extent, I think also a concept that's often overcomplicated. And particular sort of academics and researchers have a tendency to present this in a sort of overcomplicated way. So I will briefly reflect on that. Then um, I want to introduce you to this triple resilient dividend concept. Um, with um, I've had the pleasure of developing this with colleagues at the Overseas Development Institute here in London, and it's been funded through the World Bank Group and um, GFDRR. And it's basically the brainchild of um, of Frances Gessier and um, Tom Mitchell, who who used to be at ODI, and they had this idea of actually trying to come up with a new perspective on resilience, and in a minute I will explain to you um, what, what this new concept looks like. And then, as, as initially mentioned, I want to sort of do a little bit of a deep dive, delivering resilience and, you know, what about other stakeholders and what does this idea of a business case for resilience mean. Um, okay, I'm, I don't think that anybody needs a reminder of, you know, when we say disasters or natural hazards, um, that we need a reminder of what, what this actually entails. But I always think it's good to just revisit this very briefly um, because it's a hugely complicated issue with the natural component, the hazards, actually only being one element. But then, you know, the, the way where we build, where we live, how we operate, how well we are educated, how many resources we have to deal, all that will determine, you know, the, the way that we can cope with certain risk and that we can actually respond and that we can also address risks. So I think that's, that's important to reflect and, you know, when you look at these pictures here, it's, it's just an illustration that, you know, this sort of issue is relevant across global supply chains all the way down to local farmers in developing countries. And obviously climate change has brought it um, to the fore, but this whole idea of addressing disaster risk is obviously, you know, as, as old as, as, as humanity. Um, but I think, you know, we've, we've, we have a different view now. We are sort of starting to look at it in a sort of more outward-looking, future-oriented way, trying to address the future trends, trying to anticipate that. I think there's a big shift there also using data, being much more um, and sort of technical about this. But at the end of the day, a lot of the, you know, whether we are resilient or not will depend on human decisions and on human behavior. And this is really important to, to keep in mind. So I promised you I would just very, very briefly give you that, um, that sort of definition here. And no doubt, you know, anyone on this call will have a very different view on what resilient means and how you can define it. So um, I'll leave you with that. I won't even read it out. Um, I think it's just important to acknowledge that, you know, this the concept of resilience is now being used um, amongst different community and communities, for example, in the disaster risk management community, climate adaptation, sustainable development. So there are always slightly different angles here. But 
ultimately resilience to me is is the ability to actually um, you know to 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 resist absorb accommodate and recover from from hazards and be prepared for future ones as well so there is obviously a storyline when it comes to to sort of disasters around the world and um, most of you will be familiar with the facts and figures behind that and the trends um, that disaster risk and losses are rising and they are disproportionately affecting poor countries when it comes to an impact on GDP for example. Um, but, and this is also really important, there is, um, there is significant success in addressing this, particularly when you look at saving lives and efforts to reduce sort of death through disasters. But then it sometimes feels like we're actually fighting against, you know, this, this old traditional thing about the windmills, you know, you're just constantly fighting against something that's actually getting worse and worse. And, and why is that? Well, obviously there is a lot of um, socioeconomic development and human behavior that actually increases our exposure and also increases our vulnerability to disasters. So, you know, demographic change, also where we build, how we, how we live, how we operate, all that determines future risk levels. And if you add to that climate change, you know, it just becomes a very sort of, um, well, it, it becomes a big challenge in anticipating future risk. But it also underlines the importance of actually recognizing that the future risks are actually being built right now. So, you know, assets are being put in place. So a lot of what we're deciding today will determine the future risk levels. So this has all been recognized and it's nothing new, but interestingly in 2015, this was also brought together in a way um, at international level because we had in one year three really important international frameworks coming together. So the Sendai framework, so um, sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. And you know that created a momentum and actually on the back of that momentum to actually understand how these things interact, how climate interacts with disasters, how um, poverty reduction um, it can be affected by, by disaster risk management. On the back of that, um, we felt that you know, the notion of resilience has actually received a lot of attention, but, and this is kind of my, the, the, the next point, but when you really look at you know, beyond the commitment, beyond the statements, at the end of the day, we are actually far outspending on recovery and response, so the sort of post-event funding. And we're far outspending that um, than on prevention and ex ante anticipative um, management. And this is really, you know, a problem. It's a problem because obviously we are sort of just trying to catch up and trying to address things after they've happened. And it's also a problem because going forward, you know, this will be a much more costly approach with climate change kicking in. And also with infrastructure investment taking place right now, we're sort of locking ourselves into a less resilient future if we don't address risk right now and if we don't sort of anticipate this. So that's kind of the storyline and the context. And, you know, what we did um, with the colleagues um, at the World Bank and at ODI and then a growing team of authors that was involved in this, we looked at, you know, this, the underlying um, aspects. Why is it, why are we not so, um, you know, why is, are we underspending on, on prevention and ex ante um, disaster risk reduction? And I think we're pretty good in outlining all the reasons, you know, short-termism, the lack of political incentives. Um, but one thing that we actually felt that was not, hasn't really been reflected that much was that we usually tend to look at this in the context of avoiding loss. So why do you do disaster risk reduction or disaster risk management to avoid loss and to, to, to protect people's lives? And that alone is obviously a very significant goal and very um, significant aim. But we felt that there was um, something missing um, because you are sort of looking at this in, always in the context of loss and disaster. 
So we thought that by looking at the broader picture in terms of how measures that are actually aiming at disaster risk reduction can also have other benefits, can have a much wider sort of support for development goals, for example. And you know, the, the idea was really to, to, to move away from this loss focus to a much more and po more positive development focus. So saying, even in the absence of a disaster, your investment in this particular disaster um, risk reduction infrastructure or in these measures at a community level, they make sense. They are good for development, even if you are lucky and you don't have a disaster for the next couple of years. So that was sort of the mindset that, that we we've, we've followed. And, and this picture here um, that was developed by colleagues at, at IASA who were also involved in, in, in this process, you know, they, they try to show this perspective on benefits by widening the view on benefits. You know, can we create a much stronger case for disaster risk reduction? And this is basically the, the idea behind what we then call the, the triple um, dividend concept. And the starting point again is, you know, this, this recognition that this incomplete cost-benefit analysis result in, in insufficient investment in disaster risk management and particular in the risk reduction element of it. And so the, the aim was, you know, can we build a case where we can actually have a methodology that allows those who are making investment decisions, for example, the Ministry of Finance, but also more at the project level, to, to allow people to have a, a tool that gives them, you know, um, enables them to calculate and quantify those broader benefits and then in consequently making a stronger case for, for resilience and for risk management investment. So our focus was mainly Ministry of Finance officials, but um, as I'll show you later, the whole idea and the concept can be applied across different layers and different levels. Um, so here is the, the concept of the triple resilient dividend. And it's, you know, it, it's really, a, it is made up of these three key components. Um, and it's, well, the idea is to have a methodology that then enables whoever is making an assessment or an appraisal or an investment decision to actually explore, you know, what are the, the benefits that I will get out of that investment. Um, and you, as you can see, we've split this into benefits when disaster strikes and benefits that will occur regardless of disaster strikes. So I will briefly talk you through these um, three different um, dividends. So the first one is kind of the core and the traditional um, element. It's the aim of saving lives and avoiding losses. And you know, that's kind of what, what traditionally disaster risk reduction has been all about. And, you know, there is this idea of by, by looking at probabilistic risk assessment, we can actually improve our understanding and can be also much more forward looking and can try and get a better understanding of what the costs saved are and um, how we can actually justify an investment by avoiding or reducing losses or saving lives here. So that's obviously a very strong and sort of the core component. But as I said earlier, you know, we feel that there's more to it. So that's where the second dividend of resilience comes in. And this is the idea that actually disasters create um, a degree of background risk that, that prohibits sort of innovation, entrepreneurship, and investment. And it almost puts, um, puts at sort of at bay you know, these initiatives because of fear um, of future disasters and fear of facing a disaster. And it could even that, um, lean to, towards a situation where a particular community is actually not being able to attract any investment or any, any sort of um, entrepreneurial business in, in activities because of fear of, div of disaster. So here, obviously, um, an approach to work more to address the underlying risk 
can unlock and can kind of create an, um, an, an enabling environment that will actually trigger, um, you know, planning or, or sort of development um, investments in that particular area. And um, tools and methods for that are not straightforward. We've um, in, in this project, we kind of looked at some simple proxies, how you can measure that. So you could have a look at expected land value changes. You could also discuss what the risk thresholds are for investment, and then discuss how by lowering the risks, you would actually secure more investment in a particular area. But the one thing that's really important in this context is that, you know, it's it's all about you know enabling and unlocking economic potential despite the risk and you know that's kind of what we call the second dividend there is a a danger or there's a big question mark behind this because obviously you know you there is a danger that you overdo it that you actually encourage too much investment in let's say the wrong area and you kind of generate almost a false sense of security. And actually, at the end of the day, um, things would actually be much, much worse. And you would actually create future risk. So that's the important thing. It needs to be done in a holistic way. And it needs to be driven by knowledge and, and information about how to build and where to build and doing that in a sensible way. Otherwise, you're just making things, things worse here. So and then the third aspect is um, the co-benefits. So this is very common in other areas, for example, in infrastructure, also climate change mitigation. We have looked at co-benefits for a long time. Um, so the idea is to, to also apply that concept, the idea of co-benefits that actually occur through an investment in disaster risk management. So for example, you invest in a, in a community center um, that will sort of have multiple functions. And one of those main functions is to provide some shelters, maybe a refuge in case of disaster. But it can also be used for, for other purposes. So it's this idea of having co-benefits arising from that. Or a community that gets um, a, a new fleet of, of fishing bo of, of boats, and the boats can be used in, in case of floods to actually become sort of a lifeline for that village, but um, outside the flood time, they can, they can be used for, for other purposes, and, you know, there are sort of co-benefits arising from that. So, you know, you can use your imagination, and there are, again, this is not a new concept, but it really hasn't been applied that much to disaster risk reduction efforts. And, um, you know, this includes economic co-benefits, co but also social co-benefits, social cohesion, transparency, education, and then last but not least, environmental co-benefits. So this is sort of ecosystem services, also investing in, in, di in disaster risk reduction can have an in environmental um, impact. You have sort of new green areas in a city, for example. So the idea is that you try and capture and measure that and create, by adding that to your list of benefits, you create a much stronger case for resilience. So you might think, well, this is all great. It looks like a, an interesting um, concept. So what does this mean in practice? And we have, with the colleagues of the World Bank and at ODI and GFDRR, we have are working on some practical case studies sort of at, at different scales, sort of local level, at a city level, or at national level, to actually, you know, underpin this with numbers and underpin this with, with um, you know, the sort of output that you then want to present to decision makers. And um, this, you know, the, the indication is that this works. There are some some questions around which are the best tools to do it and how, you know, how what you need to actually equip in terms of data, in terms of, of skills. But the 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 message emerging from those tests is that, you know, this is a this is a useful tool to actually support the case for resilient investment. Um, 
so what we did based on those initial findings from the case studies, we came up with some sort of recommendations of you know how actually this could be integrated in in sort of disaster risk reduction or risk management appraisals. So starting point for that is you actually really have to understand the problem and the context and also understanding the different interactions between threats and risk drivers. You then need to have a good understanding of what tools and methods could help you with underpinning this with the empirical analysis. And then, and this is really important, you then have to be good at communicating this because there's no way that you just um, have the output of a model. You actually need to explain this and you also need to relate this to you know, whoever makes the decision, whatever their view is on um, you know, on, on the risk itself, but also risk aversion comes into play and how you could actually sell this as a link into development intervention, for example, or as part of the growth agenda. So that's really important, the, the, the way you sell it and the way you, you introduce this to whoever makes the decision. So this is, you know, in a nutshell, the, the triple revit dividend of resilient concept um, and we've we've underpinned this um, you know there's the method and the, the the framework and in this new book that we've produced we asked um, um, a range of experts in the field to actually add, look at the different dividends from different angles and I'll just outline this here um, so we we had a strong focus on this idea of, of unlocking the economic potential. So, you know, what, what does this mean? What can we actually, you know, how can you quantify and account for that? We also looked at the co-benefits. We have some, some examples of this there. And then the key question, how can you all take that into a discussion with um, fiscal policy um, um, makers and, and, and Ministry of Finance officials who are actually making the funding decisions around disaster risk management? Um, we had to look at the private sector and how we can actually capture the co-benefits there. And also very important, we considered the, the climate change dimension in this and how to bring in adaptation and make this a future forward-looking, outward-looking concept. And we also had looked at some interesting lessons um, there in Chapter 7 that can be gained from the understanding of economic resilience in the context of financial crisis. So this together underpins the idea and the concept and it, it, it sort of gives us the, the narrative. Um, what now needs to happen is to actually go out and, and try it and, and apply it. And this, was, this is what I said, what's currently happening and what we hope to, to do at a much broader scale. So that's kind of the concept, the toolkit, um, is you, if you like, aimed at sort of encouraging and strengthening the case for resilience. Um, I just want to briefly look at sort of another dimension and another element of, of resilience, um, because this is kind of when, when we talk about resilience and delivering resilience and talking about the business case for resilience, you know, often insurance comes into play and and clearly insurance has a key role to play in addressing disaster risk and the first role there is um, it helps us in terms of recovery and it in, in terms of of smoothing the losses so there is a you know there is a big um, significant role for insurance to play in in supporting our financial resilience if you like but um, this could act, insurance has another can play another role, another dimension. Um, in fact, insurance can can have an influence on the underlying risk and risk behavior, and also on our willingness to go down a more sort of preventive route or not. And I will explain to you this this in a minute because this is actually something that can go both ways. For, for some people, insurance is also actually a disincentive for not taking further action. So if you, as a government or as a homeowner, have insurance, does it mean that you then stop worrying about you know, the disaster itself because you know you have insurance and that's for your problem solved? 
or is actually insurance created in a way that it incentivizes you as a, as a farmer or you as a homeowner, as a business or as a government to actually work with the insurer to understand your risk better, to, to take certain measures to address the underlying risk. And this is sort of this question, can insurance help us build the case for risk reduction and for resilience? Um, and there are different ways that insurance can do it. I've listed some of them here. But as my work and that work of others also show, um, it's really not utilized um, as much as it could in the context of, of climate risk. And here are some examples from a study we did looking at developing countries. And in a lot of developing countries where we now see insurance emerging as a tool to, ex to address flood risk or drought risk, um, on the face of it, there is actually not, usually not, a, in most schemes, there's not a sort of risk reduction emphasis in, in it. Um, and there is a risk transfer element, but that's it, and it's not really fully integrated into disaster risk um, management efforts. This picture is starting to change, and we have um, are just a couple of new initiatives that, that have recently been put up, which are sort of aiming to, you know, see insurance as, as a tool to also address the, the resilience and, and improve not just the financial stability and not just enable someone to recover from a loss because he gets a payout, but also to, to basically address the underlying risks. And these examples that I'm giving here, they've been sort of designed with this in mind, but all of them are, are still sort of struggling to really um, to really sort of implement that, and, and their sort of pilot studies are working in this direction. But it's, it's not straightforward, and it just shows the, the difficulties of actually using something that is so, you know, so used to risk and has so much information and knowledge about risk, risk than, than insurance as, as an industry, but also as an instrument that's been used for a long time. And applying this to really address underlying risk is, you know, it's not, um, is, is a challenge and there are lots of reasons and this is also triggering innovation so it's a very positive process um, but um, you know when you look at at this picture here from um, this kind of shows you where we are or where we where we currently are in sort of using insurance to to, to cover financial losses arising from disasters and this is to sort of coin the term, protection gap. So you see in, a, in most developing countries, uh, insurance is heavily underutilized. And when I, I hear protection gap, I always say, well, to me, this is also an indication of, of a resilience gap because, yes, you know, in having insurance and covering insurance is, is an important aspect, but actually what you really want is also to address the underlying risk. And because this is also a question of, of securing future insurability. So when you look at those countries that have insurance and that are using insurance already, um, for example, here in the UK, we, we have discussions around flood insurance and the availability and affordability of flood insurance going forward. And the actually only way to really address this is by putting strong emphasis on managing flood risk and addressing flood risk and making homes more resilient. Otherwise, insurance runs out as an option um, and it becomes too, too expensive. So there's a direct connection there. But how can you then build a case for the insurance industry to actually play a much stronger role in, in supporting resilience? And this comes back to the idea of, you know, what's the business case for resilience? And um, I'm at the moment working with, with several insurance companies um, through the Climate Wise Initiative, and they're very keen to sort of explore, and they, they're actually looking for, for support to build a stronger internal case for resilient invest, for investment in resilience, and also for aligning their, their products, their underwriting, their, their own tools with resilience. And here's an excerpt um, from a recent report they produced that was looking at investing for resilience, and the potential benefits that it can bring to the industry, 
but also to others, but it also outlines the, the challenges that they're facing. And I think this is this together with the triple dividend resilience concept together, you know, applying our concept to to this sector could actually be a good testing case to see how we can unlock some of this potential, how can we kind of address some of the challenges and, and help actually a, a sector and industry to realize the benefits, but also their clients and governments and, and other stakeholders. So just before we close, you know, I think there is a significant opportunity right now in making sure that the resilience case is strongly heard when you look in the when you look at infrastructure i mean there's a massive amount of infrastructure investment needed around the world and there's a huge commitment to invest in infrastructure so ensuring that resilience and you know future risks are being taken into account and that this actually becomes a piece in the puzzle of of becoming you know supporting sustainable development is really essential and this is where I think um, the triple resilient dividend can also again uh, achieve greater clarity and support that case, and also bring in, you know, home in the the benefits that that resilience can bring to those who are making investment decisions. So this was kind of in a, a brief sort of outline of the concept. There are a couple of of publications available. Um, on the ODI website, there is the triple dividend concept explained, and obviously we have we have the book that came out in in December um, through the support of the World Bank Group and GFDR. But if you have any questions or want to follow up, also on the the insurance work that I'm currently doing, where the focus is really on building up. Um, and, and showing that that resilience works both for a business but also for other stakeholders, then you know please please get in touch and I'm happy or I'm looking forward to the to the discussion um, that we hopefully have now. And with this, I will sort of go share now sort of the the floor with the organizers. Yes. Thank you, Svenja. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, okay, so it's time to, to open the floor to questions. Uh, I will not open my webcam for the time being because I will be very busy in reading all the questions, so I will appear in a, after the Q&A session. Okay, so thank you to the audience for uh, for your responsiveness, we received many questions, and maybe we can start from the end, let's say, uh, with the first question connected to um, the insurance tool you, you were presenting. Mm -hmm. so, um, for example, you were showing a graph uh, about the protection gap. So one of the questions is about the, the feasibility, let's say, of this kind of tool in developing countries. How much insurance is a, a real option in developing countries? And how can be the uh, issue of affordability of this kind of tools uh, be addressed, for example, at the community level? OK. Yeah, thank you for that question. So. Um, I think it's it's important to first of all to think about what do you want to achieve um, and what is the aim. So I think if the aim is to actually create greater resilience and community resilience and to to support adaptation um, and to sort of support sustainable development in a country, then you will see that you have already um, you know a, a very broad focus on how you hope to apply insurance. So the reason why I'm saying that is I think the wrong way to look at this is to just look at one particular hazard. So let's say we have a drought um, problem in a country and then bring in drought insurance as a stopgap. I don't think that's the that's the right way because that might actually have lots of unintended consequences, and we have seen that in the past. So, you know, you you, you bring in insurance, but you haven't actually done 
all the other steps. You haven't really sort of established what the risks are. You haven't done a set up sort of an, an, a risk understanding, a risk um, analysis. You haven't done um, a sort of development of, of options and, and changes in, in land use practice and so on. I think there's a lot that comes first. And once you've done that, then you can say, okay, for the really those losses that at the, that you know are unexpected, where we need you know people to have the sort of financial backup. That's where insurance can help. But it it comes in my mind. It comes a long way down. You know, you have to do a lot of other things first before actually insurance can can come and help you. Um, so that that's usually I think the whole idea of setting creating sort of an, an enabling environment to understand the risk to address the risk to manage it and then you can try and also transfer it um, that part of the risk um, that actually is where it makes sense to transfer it otherwise you just you know you're just having a stopgap that might actually not be there in a couple of years time because it becomes too expensive or um, it insurers um, lose interest in it. Okay, thank you Svenja. Actually continuing <laughs> talking about insurance, uh, based on your extensive experience in the field, uh, some of the participants are asking if you could actually provide an example of how climate risk insurance works. And maybe we could actually have an example from uh, an industrialized country and one from a developing country to accommodate the curiosities of all uh, the attendees. Okay, well, I mean, there, there are diff many different forms and shapes. So the term sort of climate risk insurance has been framed to cover agriculture insurance, sovereign risk insurance, and property insurance. So it's a wide range of insurance products that that are out there. So one example, in, and that's the most common one in developing countries, is agriculture insurance, where you actually provide a, a farmer, let's take the case of a farmer, you provide a farmer with some level of insurance protection. So you give him the opportunity to pay a premium and to then have the the knowledge that if, for example, rainfall drops under a certain amount of threshold, so if you have a prolonged spell of, of days without rainfall, then after a certain threshold is hit, let's say after 30 days without rain, you will get a payout um, from that insurance policy. Another way is around flood insurance, where you can have a let's say a local shopkeeper and he has um, a policy that will pay out when his premises get flooded so that can be maybe linked to a to a credit a small credit that he's been taking out to actually build up his business and part of that process was also to pay some premium to protect his new business and to protect you know also the the credit that's been being put into that new business. So one is actually, you know, very close to the what we call the indemnity concept. So you know, with the flooding one, there, you would the the shopkeeper would get the payout when his his shop or his 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 assets or his tools are damaged or lost. And in the case of the the farmer there, he would get the payout, you know, if a certain um, weather event takes place, so these 30 days without rainfall, for example. Um, but then you have other forms, you have at a sovereign risk level, you have governments that, that take out insurance, disaster insurance, where they actually protect the government's budget against, you know, disaster losses and against the, the need to shift government budget in order to pay for disaster losses. So we have the African Risk Capacity, we have CRIF in the Caribbean, where a lot of countries have pooled together and are buying um, protection against different types of disasters and they will get a payout um, if the disaster 
strikes. And that payout won't cover all of their losses, very important, but it can support them and it can give them, um, enable them or protect their budget and, and enable them actually to, to plan better because it also gives them greater security in knowing what what payout they will get. They, they don't have to, you know, to sort of expect that they will get some post-disaster support. They know they can sort of budget that if a disaster happens, they know what payout they will get from, from insurance. Okay, uh, so another question on insurance, and maybe then we move to the first part uh, of your presentation. And the question focuses on what are, in your opinion, the key barriers or issues for re both reinsurers and insurance to systematically incorporate climate change risk in risk underwriting. So is it an issue of data? Is it an issue of inadequacy of current modeling tools and the fact that they are kind of black boxes for several reinsurers users. Is it policy? Is it regulations? What's your feeling on that? Okay, well this is, it's a, it's a complicated one because there is a long list and I always kind of smile because it's quite easy when you sit together with a group of policymakers or with a group of insurers to talk about barriers and you know you often people it's very easy you get a long list like 10 issues that they identify as barriers and I have to say I sometimes wonder well you know it's quite easy to say what prevents you from doing something um, but I think we need to be be careful not to lose sight that you know some of these these things could possibly be easily addressed so I think one issue is um, the the cost benefit, um, the understanding of cost benefit of, of resilience, and this is particularly um, visible in in a developing uh, in developed country context. I'll just give you an example um, from the, from the UK, where it's actually for an insurer not well. It's been been very difficult for an insurer to use their flood insurance underwriting policies to incentivize people to become more flood resilient. Um, one thing is a lot of insurers say they don't have much confidence in how well some of these risk reduction measures work. They also say we don't know how well um, homeowners are operating them. So if it's like a flood gate, a door, you know, will people actually really close the door when the water comes or maybe they're not there and then the whole thing will flood anyway. So there's the behavioral idea and do we actually, re can we really rely on these things to work? Then it's an understanding, do we know where these defenses are, like flood defenses that the government has put in place? Do we actually know how well they're maintained, how well they're operating and, you know, if the water doesn't come from the coast, but it rains, do they still operate? So there are some technical questions which, um, which in insurers often ask where they say they don't have enough, enough confidence or enough um, support. From the, from the homeowner's point of view, a challenge is also to, you know, to, to justify the, you know, the investment because it's a question of, you know, paying up front to make your home more resilient, um, you, you understand that this will make you safer in the future, but nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's a question you have to justify that investment right now. And unfortunately, some statistics here from the UK show that people only do that after the third time. They, so, you know, you have to be flooded third time or three times before you're actually really willing to consider making your home more resilient. And that's a sort of behavioral barrier, also concept around resilience as a sort of negative, you know, not nice thing to have in your house idea. And, you know, the list goes on with policymakers. It's also the, you know, the, obviously the pressure around, you know, spending money on other things rather than, than resilience. And in some cases we see it again and again, you know, the willingness to actually go out and, and support people after an event, which is, you know, often much more publicity um, um, catching than 
investing prior to an event and it usually gets more attention. So, you know, there's a variety of things and, you know, I think a lot of that has been long known. But our idea with the Triple Resilience Dividend Concept is to just, you know, strengthen the case for resilience in all those areas and just say, okay, we understand the challenge, we understand your concerns, but, you know, here, if you look at the bigger picture, you know, maybe this can convince you, maybe this can strengthen the, the case for you. So that's, that's the idea, um, at least, behind it. Okay, so let's move uh, uh, to the first part of your presentation. And I will try to put together uh, two different questions. One, well, or consideration. Um, a participant was stressing that basically you are focusing mainly on benefits. Uh, what about the costs? What about, for example, the opportunity cost of disaster risk measures? If we think about how public programs um, cannot really. Um, um, Okay, I would say the other way around. Uh, if alternative public programs cannot be really pursued, uh, do you think a similar detailed assessment of costs is possible? And then um, there are also benefits that are not, um, they cannot be put in monetary terms. So, what about the social and the environmental uh, benefits? Uh, can you elaborate more on, on that? Okay, on the, the question around the cost, yes, this is something that we, we discussed initially and, and we I think we also outlined this in the in the publication that obviously talking about the benefits doesn't mean that you know you ignore the cost and, and also you know there's some opportunity cost. And in fact, um you know we it's it's probably possible to do you know also an assessment of 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 the cost and extend the current way of looking at the cost and, and, and looking, you know, sort of broadening the, the opportunity cost and looking at, at the different types of cost to that. We didn't do that, but I, I you know, when you do a cost-benefit analysis, it's clear that that will need to be part of it. So, um, you know, it, it, it needs to be integrated there. I didn't show it here as a component, but I think you know whenever you you need to justify a case for investment, obviously the costs also need to be need to be addressed and, and need to be integrated there. Um, so the the other question was around the environmental benefits, and yes, I mean this is the third dividend, the sort of co-benefit as we called it, and um, there is. You know, the, we have the social, social benefits, but also environmental benefits that arise. For example, I gave, I think I gave the example of, of having more green spaces in cities, but also um, mangrove um, using sort of ecosystem services for disaster risk management. Also, less pollution. I mean, there are all sorts of environmental benefits that once you've you kind of envisaged how that particular disaster risk reduction infrastructure could look like and how you could design it with you know with environmental protection in mind that's when 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 you kind of imagine how these benefits could arise you quantify and assess that um, there are some some tools and some technology um, some some methods that have been developed and I think I make a reference to that again on the climate mitigation front and also around infrastructure and and, and in various other areas it's pretty standard to also look at the broader environmental benefits and yes it's it's not easy to monetize these benefits but it can be done and there are methodologies that allow you to do that Okay, so uh, thank you, Svenja. And maybe I will link uh, to this, this question uh, to ask you more about uh, what kind of analytical tools are required to comprehensively take into account all these dividends of resilience and at different scales. So, so some uh, participants ask about this kind of evaluation at the project scale, uh, but also, of course, you can go up. Uh, through the national uh, scale also. So what are the main challenges uh, you, you'll see in this kind of, uh, in assessing, let's say, both benefits and costs, as we were saying? 
Yeah, I mean, our idea was to first to, to try and develop the framework and then apply it. And we, we have, as I said, we have taken it, um, we had looked at var various case studies. Um, we, had, we have some examples from Mexico, for example, where um, I think it's in, in Tabasco, um, sort of flat risk management investment there. Um, a project that we analyzed there together with the, you know, the, the government officials, the, um, the, the people who actually implemented the flood protection measures, um, where that allowed us to sit down with them and, and look at the data that exists. So look at the risk data, what kind of risk assessment have they done? And for the first dividend, that is important also to have a probabilistic risk assessment. So, you know, that's kind of the first tool that you need. For the second dividend, um, the question is then, you know, how can you actually anticipate the sort of economic um, spillover effects, if you like, you know, this unlocking um, economic potential there. And there, this idea of looking at land value and, and expected change in land value, and there was some analysis being done about that to actually show that if you kind of protect this area, you know, it suddenly becomes, um, you know, it can increase in value and people might actually want to live or to build there and to invest there. So we had a, 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 an analysis around that. And then for the third um, dividend, it's, what I've just outlined, this idea of, first of all, mapping the different benefits, the co-benefits, if you like, so the identifying, you know, any kind of, of benefits that might arise. You also have to, at the community level, do this through stakeholder discussions. Um, it's also important to reflect on what people perceive, you know, what are the benefits that they see that, for example, this new flat, flat risk infrastructure brings to them, to their own lives. And then you have sort of a list of, of things that, that come up in this discussion. And then you can try to apply these sort of um, um, economic appraisal tools or, you know, there's a long list. And in, in one of the documents, we have sort of a table that gives you a number of tools that can help you to, to appraise then the, the investment according to those, those benefits. But, you know, it's an intensive process, um, no doubt, and that's also one of the, the challenges, you know, you have to actually buy, have to buy in in order to underpin this, to have the figures, to have the, you know, the, the data and to run the analysis. You have to have initial buy-in from government but also from other stakeholders. So that's kind of the challenge at the moment. For testing it, it's okay. You can go into places, for example, like in Mexico, as we did, places where there is already a degree of, you know, significant awareness and investment happening, and you can try and test the, mod the framework against that. And then as a next step, I think sort of updating it and developing so it can also be applied in other areas with less um, experience and also with, with less knowledge. Okay, thank you, Svenja. A very last question, and I would ask you maybe a quick response because we are almost uh, running out of time. Uh, we go back to insurance. And can a dynamic, evolutive approach of insurance premiums not only based on past and average damages, but also on local and multidimensional assessment of vulnerabilities be developed? Um, well, I mean, I think insurance companies, when they look at risk, they are now, they're getting more sophisticated and you can build in into their risk models. You can also build in an understanding of of the hazard, the exposure, and vulnerabilities. So I think this is already p becoming part of it. But, but you know, you then I think the question would be, what do you want to achieve with that? And you know, if, again, if you really want to address, you know, people's projection, if you want to transform the way they 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 work, the way they live then, you know, you need to see how insurance, which risk part insurance can best cover. So it's really understanding, you know, the, 
the different components, the exposure, the vulnerability, and the hazard, and then say, okay, where do you, how can insurance be best integrated? So I think in this context, I would need a bit of more information about what the community context would be. Um, but vulnerability is something that's being con considered as an important factor for designing these new insurance schemes, yes. Okay, I think uh, we don't have any additional time to, to take uh, some other questions on board. The questions were really a lot, so I thank all the participants for their uh, engagement. And I remind you that both these slides and the recording of the webinar will be available uh, by tomorrow on the ICCZ website, uh, which is iccgov.org, but you can see it in, actually in the last slide, I guess. And so I, I take the opportunity to thank uh, Svenja again. It was really um, a pleasure to kickstart uh, this series with you, and I'm so happy that also our attendees really enjoyed it. And maybe also take the occasion to invite you attending uh, the next webinar, which will be taking place on the 28th of April. We're going to focus on ecosystem-based um, disaster risk reduction with uh, Fabrice Renault, which is, who is the head of the Environmental Vulnerability and Ecosystem Services section at the United Nations University. So another very exciting uh, webinar uh, is forthcoming. And thank you again. I really hope to virtually meet you uh, pretty soon at our next webinar. Thank you, Svenja, again, and thank you all for okay. participating. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining.